So you have worked with Marvel before, I have. of course, on What If and Miss Marvel. Right. Two questions about that. Yeah. What is something about the composing process that has stayed consistent from project to project to project? But then I want to know a unique challenge that was specific to the Marvels. Great question. Um, the thing that stays consistent in, in any film project, but particularly the MCU, is you have to write an iconic theme. You've got to have two to four bars of music, something that is instantly recognizable, instantly singable. So that is consistent across projects. You've got to write that theme. People have got to love it. And it's got to be able to be associated. It's, it's a signature for each project. For this one, for the Marvels, I think figuring out what space sounds like was the big, the big, the big one. Um, there's actually no sound in space. Sound is felt in space and not heard. So how do you do that? I mean, there are a lot of ways, which I can get into if you're interested. I am because I think I know one of those ways. You and tell I, me then. I read a lot about uh, the drumming yes, in the movie, right. which which makes all the sense in the world to me. And I'm very excited to hear in context of the full feature. Well, I'll tell you about it. it, it a, lot of, um, a lot of the sounds of space were created in conjunction with this incredible percussionist, Evelyn Glennie. Here's the thing about Evelyn. She's profoundly deaf. So she, when she plays, she actually doesn't wear shoes. She feels the sound through her body, which is exactly how you feel it in space. It's so crazy. So we started creating sounds together that were not like anything that you have ever heard before. And because of the way that she listens, and it's a very physical thing for her, I think that that... that permeates every aspect of the sonic life of this project. So that was one way. The other way, which is like way sillier, is we went to um, a prop house in Burbank and we rented space junk, like literally stuff that fell out of the sky. What is the most random piece of space junk you found? And maybe did it also make it into the sound of the movie? Yeah, it did. Um, I think these titanium discs, which are really weird because they're super light, like they look like they'd be heavy, but they're really light and you can bow them. And it's this incredible sound. It's like nothing you've ever heard. Oh, you didn't just use it as inspiration. You actually use oh, these no, physical were, pieces of like, space we, junk. <laughs> basically, I went there and we, we figured out how you could make sounds out of them. And then anything that you could, like we went there with like a bow and various beaters and stuff like that. And anything that you could make a sound out of, we rented and then and then used in the film. Just emphasizes that music can come from literally anywhere. I no, love it. No, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, we could go around this room and make a score for a film with just what's hanging, these lights, your shoes, you know, I don't know what else is hanging out here. I, but we could make, we could play anything in here and make a cool score. The next time I cross paths with you at a junket, we're not talking about the movie. No. We are making a junket score. We can do it. <laughs> I love Let's this go. Idea. Let's go. So I want to go back to the idea of themes because I had read that you went back and you listened to right. some uh, very iconic Marvel themes and it was making me curious, which one of the bunch did you find most influential when you started to tackle the themes in the Marvels? I think the Avengers, maybe, because this is an Avenger style film. So I think the energy and also this idea of creating something new for, you know, for a team rather than kind of focusing on individual characters. I think that was something that influenced me a lot. And I, I think that's a part of it. I think the energy of that is, it, you know, plays a role in this. And, and I think Alan Silvestri is really good at getting a motor going. So I think a musical motor. And so I think that that had an influence on me. But I also go to a lot of like weird musical s sources. Like, I mean, this is, this is going to sound completely crazy, but there's this moment in the beginning of an opera by this English composer, Benjamin Britten, that are these like strings kind of sliding around, and that had a huge influence on me, and the theme opens that way. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I want to jump to crafting a theme for a villain. What pointers, tips, or tricks would you give to another composer looking to craft a theme for a villain that doesn't just say, like, this is a bad guy, but rather reflects the fact that 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 character has nuance and isn't just villain and nothing more. Well, I think that that you, I mean, you captured exactly the point is with a hero and with a villain, you want to have something that can cover 
an emotional range, right? Because not every not every villain is totally bad and not every hero is totally good. That doesn't make for an interesting movie and it certainly doesn't make for an interesting score. So I think going for something unusual for the villain was important. Um, I think going for something that... I think I, m the instrumentation that I chose was quite unusual. Um, and I think having something that kind of slithered was really important for this particular person. I like a lot of the score that I was able to uh, check out. That's the track that I've been re-listening to Do, the most since yeah. I received it. I love yeah, it. It's pretty groovy. <laughs> Do uh, the Flurkin have a theme? And if not, what specific sounds were you using most for them? I am going to leave that to the audience to find out when you see it, mostly because there'll be some wonderful surprises okay. there. I like really that. big moments. I will take that. Yeah. I, I want all the big moments you for the You will flirting. love it. You will love it. You this, will laugh out loud. This question, the answer might just be no, but I was reading the uh, credits for the film, mm -hmm. and I noticed that some of John Ottman's scores from uh -huh. the X-Men movies were credited. Is that something you got to work with? And if so, how did you go about incorporating them in your own original score? I think we'll leave that to, to, <laughs> to big surprises, too. Okay. Go Thursday night and you can find out all the answers to these questions. Again, another excellent tease. I'll end with a fun question. Okay. Just given what the Marvels go through in this movie, I am curious if you had the opportunity to swap places with two other artists in this industry to walk in their shoes, experience their day to day, what two artists would you choose and why? God, what a great question. There's a question I've never been asked. My job um, is done. Steven Spielberg. I think maybe to really feel that kind of like directorial finesse, I think is something that's that he that he has that's amazing. And another person, um, God, I don't know. I it, I think how about Dorothy Arsner? And you're going to ask me who is Dorothy okay, Arsner? Okay, yes, I am. Her, Dorothy Arsner was the first woman to be admitted to the DGA. She was a director in the golden age of Hollywood, and she directed tons of movies. And how she got away with what she got away with, I would love to jump into her body and figure that out. Excellent choices yeah. right there. Thank you so much for your time Thank today. Thank you so Congratulations much. Congratulations on this and American Fiction. Thank you very much. We're I appreciate that. We're going to be hearing that. your name a whole lot oh, in the good. coming months. Well, listen, I thanks, know it. thanks for being so well prepared. You had great questions.